Yeah. All right, we're live. So, yeah. So it's um, September, late September, 2017, and uh, we do not have James and Judy because they were uh, busy. James and Judy were too busy. I just want to tell you who we got in a minute here, but let me just give everybody who happens to be listening to this a uh, little refresher. So last December, James sent me a text. He's go. He's like, oh, let's get on the webinar thing and have a, a thing on the webinar. And I'm like, all right, cool. So I invited Judy to because she's a good friend. And uh, I thought he meant let's do like a webinar and podcast it and record it, which I did. And he's, he thought we were just going to shoot the shit, right, and get around, just sit around, talk around the table, so to speak, with other photographers. But it turned out we had so much fun. Uh, I turned it into a monthly thing. So what I'm hoping, I'm hoping that uh, they're not losing steam because we've been doing this since last December religiously every month. And I understand things get busy, but also, you know, if you guys, uh, James and Julie or li Judy, are listening to this, uh, yeah, I hope you're not losing steam. And I hope that, because this is what happens, right? You ever notice that when you start something that's really hard to maintain discipline, you start a goal, you start a new habit, you start a new direction you want to go into, you know, I'm going to get up at 7 in the morning. It's good for a week. Or you start going to the gym or you start uh, uh, new positive habits that take a little bit. At first, they're fun. And then the next thing you know. So, James, Judy, if you're listening to this, man, we want you back next month. But who we have on the screen now is, uh, you know, Brent. Brent Jervet. How you doing, Brent? Good. How are you, Rob? Good. A.K.A. The Grunt. <laughs> we... That's his name, the Grunt. No, I'm gonna just. I'll explain to everybody if uh, anybody doesn't know who you are. I'll explain the backstory. Okay. How old were you when I met you first? So uh, it was a little while ago, but I think I was about 15. Possibly 16. I Maybe think you were. Yeah, around there. Are you? I. I was thinking about this the other day because I told my daughter you were 15, but then I was like, no, I think you were 17 because I think you were in university. No. Nope. No. Okay. <laughs> Um, you were at a wedding, your cousin's wedding, it was about, you're 30 years old now, so this would have been about 2005-ish, and uh, I was, uh, I remember sort of seeing you around there, but you were like one of these annoying guests with the DSLR. <laughs> and I knew it, I totally knew it at that time. Well, but I got to tell you, that sort of thing doesn't bother me when I go to a wedding. So it didn't bother me then. It doesn't bother me now. When I see people with – actually, nowadays, DSLRs are more rare than ever. For, and I think it's because of cell phones. People are bringing cell phones, and, and they're, right. it's making people lazy so they don't bring their DSLRs. I see them once in a while, um, which kind of makes my job easier because I can go and set up in the hall, and I can go to Optical Slave with all my flashes. And if they're flat – you know, if there's everybody has all these cameras, they're firing and wasting my battery. So <laughs> – I prefer to use Pocket Wizard's Radio Slave, but I am not shy these days to go with Optical Slave, given the, that scenario that so many people have cell phones and they're too lazy to bring their DSLRs. So you were one of these people, the cousin of the bride at this wedding, and I remember it was at the it was in the hall, uh, the grand entrance that started, I believe, correcto. Uh, you no. were just kind of walking around on the dance floor, and I was doing something, and I started chatting to you. Yeah. I think you came up to me and you said, you don't mind if I take pictures, do you? Well, yeah, and I remember because it was one of the first, like, uh, you know, I'd sort of gotten into photography, and it was one of the first, oh, this is kind of an event happening, <laughs> and I had brought my camera before, then I would just, you know, <laughs> screw around with my camera with a bunch of different, like, inanimate objects, but, um, <laughs> but then when you were there, I was like, wait, if I was in his shoes, and there was this other guy, like, you know, trancing around, taking photos, he's in my way and stuff, I would feel like, who's this guy, right? So I just <laughs> use a bit of, I guess, photographer's empathy to uh, go up to you and say, like, do you mind? Like, is this a big problem or what? Yeah, didn't bother me at all. And uh, we had a little chat. And I think you gave me your card. Yeah, it was this really awful business card with basically <laughs> just my name printed on it. <laughs> With a logo of a Hasselblad. That's what my first card was, a logo of a Hasselblad. And I didn't even Most own a Hasselblad. don't know what a Hasselblad is anymore. <laughs> big ass, <laughs> big ass camera from Sweden. Yeah, they're beautiful. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, so yeah, and then uh, I that week, 
you know, I took your card out and I went and checked out your pictures. I don't know where you if you had a website, I don't know where your pictures were, but they were somewhere. Was it like a Flickr account or something like that? That's exactly it. Yeah, they were just right. hosted on that. And I went and checked you out, and uh, I, I, I was like, wow, this guy's got an eye. So normally, I know it sounds like I'm being a bit of a dick here, but normally you see a lot of people that they call themselves photographers, they want to be photographers, and they got Flickr accounts or whatever, and they got websites, and you go there and you go, oh, that's awful. Uh, but your work you was you had a natural gift. You had um, your work was nice and strong. By the way, this happened with Jillian. I don't know if you know Jillian yeah. down in Coburg, Ontario. Uh, James and I were in Toronto. We put out a call early 2000s. We were going to uh, Chinatown for a random dinner, and Jillian said, "I'm I'm going to meet you guys." She her and her husband showed up. She was in university. She was heading off to med school or becoming a nurse or something like that. She brought her portfolio. Very similar with you. Um, so I'm sitting there and I'm looking at her work and I'm like, it's really strong. And I could tell. Now, had it not been strong for you, I probably wouldn't have sent you an email. Yeah, had well, it I not would... been strong for Jillian, I probably would have said nothing or little. But I told her it was strong and I asked her a question. And this question she still brings up to this day. Uh, I asked her what she was taking in school, and she told me. And I asked her, well, uh, do you like it? <laughs> <laughs> and she just went. So anyways, that week she emailed me. She said, I quit school. I'm going full-time photography. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to correct something I said earlier. Uh, you asked me if in 2005 when we met, I was in university. And, uh, and you were right. I was. I thought you were. Yeah, yeah I was. But you you were like you were pretty like what first or second year you were pretty academically strong weren't you? So uh, second year when we met I was in second year university doing computer sciences <laughs> and uh, was good at it was just bored um, you know none of it was at I, least I'm uh, sorry I'm sorry I, I derailed your entire life. <laughs> you could have a real job right now. I don't want it, seriously. <laughs> you sure about that? No regrets? No way. Because you, you can go back to school. It's not too late. You're only 30. you got lots of time left. You sound like my parents. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, let's bring up your parents. What did they think about you? Because you went to school. You dropped that program. You've got two years of university, right? Yeah, and uh, just decided this is boring this is not I don't want to sit in on a desk well not on a desk but at a desk uh, typing on a computer all the time I'm I was good at it I enjoyed it um, when I did it on my own and then I just thought man like I, I think meeting you actually was a catalyst to me actually uh, diving into a bit of thought deep thought about well what is it actually that that drives me and that um, I could, you know, could sustain me for many years considering, you know, that's what university is supposed to do is set you up for a lot of years. So yeah. uh, I realized, yeah, I have this interest in computer stuff and technology, but it's, it's people that really jazzes me. And uh, I couldn't articulate that until uh, really you and I started really um, interacting with people all over, right? Every the jobs that we did, you'd, you'd have uh -huh. no choice but to interact with people and be their best friends in three minutes. And uh, yeah. and then I just, so I, I didn't only get the bug for photography, but I got the bug for uh, people, really. And, you you uh, didn't have that bug so much prior, or that was sort of a new thing, new, sort of like, mm -hmm. well, I'd imagine. You didn't seem horribly reclusive or shy or... Uh, what do you call that personality type? The ones that are like not introverted. Outgoing? Yeah, you didn't seem any of those things. Introverted, shy, reserved. You, you didn't seem horribly outgoing, but it's somewhere in the middle. Yeah. But, so uh, I, it was. You met me at a transition stage, actually, because I, I, I definitely, definitely am an introvert, and uh, and in my younger years, I, I was very shy. Um, certainly enjoyed people, but had no idea how to approach like strangers. Let's say, right? Uh, 
and so uh, I think the year or two before I met you, I I got this job at a local gas station, and you know, young kid just trying to make some money. Right. Um, but it was actually one of the best things for me because um, what I the job I had there was just pumping people's gas, which sounds pretty simple and anybody can do it. But yeah, yeah, exactly right. Oh, but, oh, oh. Um, what ended up happening was that I was forced, you know, almost every two minutes to talk to a total stranger and to interact with them. And yeah. uh, you know, I'm just asking them how much gas they want. But if I could, is that hard? Uh, when I first started, yeah, a little bit, but then it just became routine, and I ended up learning that actually the fun part of the job was talking to the people and you know starting you got over. stuff. How long did so, it take you to get like sort of like a handle on it where you got a sense of mastery with people coming out of your shell? Yeah, I would say probably the first few months I was still sort of shy, you know, stuff like that. But um, I was there for probably two years, and it was probably by month. I don't know. Four or something like that. You that were I, pretty shy because that's a long time. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Like uh, I, I was more comfortable staying in my bedroom, you know, listening to music and doing stuff online than I was going out and meeting people. I wasn't the popular kid in high school by any means. Yeah. Um, and but that experience um, changed that for me. And actually, I would say, gave me the courage to even go up to you and say hi that day. <laughs> well, that's cool. Yeah, and so it, you know, one thing leads to another in, in, in our lives. And so uh, just yeah. from there, it grew and grew and grew. So I, I am still definitely an introvert. Uh, but I, interacting with people really is exciting for me. And it, you know, if I'm doing it for long periods of time, it can be really draining. But yeah. it's really billing all at the same time, right? Both can be true. That's exciting. We sound a lot like me. We have a lot of similar experiences because I was petrified as a child. Mm. Petrified. And uh, I came out of my shell doing school photography when I was 22. So I'm a bit of a late bloomer. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm at the tail end of this cold, so I apologize for all my hacking. Well, that's interesting. So onwards you went to college. You dropped that course and you went into photography full time. Uh, much to your parents' chagrin, I'm sure, because you have a twin brother who has a real job. <laughs> he certainly and does. An older, and an older brother who's got a university, one of them, their degrees. He's got a degree in uh, computer science, doesn't he? Uh, he's got um, some uh, electronics stuff. He's definitely has some years in computer science, and he's, yeah. Nice. They're, they're, they're more on the traditional. So you're the uh, black sheep. Brent the Black Sheep, a.k.a. the Grunt. Let me explain to everybody why we called you the Grunt, because you started hanging out with us and when we, James and I first started No BS Photo Success and all that. Back in the early days, we were doing gigs, and I don't know how many infernos you came to. If you came to any, you came to uh, Niagara School of Imaging at least one year. Yeah, and certainly an inferno somewhere. I yeah. And lots of lots of where. lots of events, lots of workshops and uh, conventions and what have you. So we would get you to carry all our stuff around and do all the dirty work. So we called you the grunt. <laughs> I, I think you guys probably wrote me into doing all that stuff by uh, I don't know reducing the price or giving me a free entrance, and I yeah. had to do all the dirty work. But I was okay with that. Yeah, it was good, a good payoff. So. Yeah. <laughs> So anyways, that was a random encounter, and we had another random encounter, um, I believe last summer I saw you at Tuco's Tacos, and I want to talk about Tuco's Tacos in a minute, because I believe there's a good marketing lesson there for everybody, but uh, I was out and about, out and about, out and about last week with my daughter, or a few days ago, we were running errands and stuff, which we, we really have a lot of fun doing these excursions, we, we just run around town doing stuff, and we have these random encounters with people, and... <laughs> There you were, side of the road, pulling in the Tuco's, and uh, I waved you over. And the last time I saw you was there, and I'm like, hey, keep meeting you here. And uh, that's, you know, the rest is history. So turns out I didn't really know you literally live an, an eighth or a sixteenth of a mile from my place. So who knew? So yeah, and, and I was complaining before we started this podcast that I've been so many times looking for assistance 
on weddings and other gigs. And I'm like, who can I hire? Who can I hire? And you were there the whole time, so I apologize for not calling you. <laughs> when it was yeah, so it's kinda, obvious. It's sort of funny because, um, you know, when we were working together, um, we did so for what a year or two, really intensively, and then uh, and then uh, I moved away to go to college for photography, and I moved to Ottawa. And uh, you know, we still stayed in touch, but. Uh, I was there for what six or seven years, and we just yeah. sort of lost touch. And uh, I still thought of you tons because you were a huge uh, inspiration for me, and you really you did switch my life over. And it took me a while to uh, see all of the benefits of that. But um, well. <laughs> but then I you know did all these crazy adventures, and somehow ended up back here in the same town as you. And yeah, yeah. Uh, and for yeah, yeah. some reason, we just never really got connected how we used to be. But uh, just running into each other randomly. And he's back. Cool. It's so, so tell, obvious. So we were chatting the other day, and I forget why, what we were chatting about, but you made a comment that I want to talk about right now. Uh, it was to do the school, and I forget, maybe my daughter was asking you, or she was asking you about school, and if you enjoyed it, or if you learned anything. And do you remember what your reply was? Uh... Yeah, so I've given a lot of thought to that. So it was uh, oh, your really? daughter asked me. You remember that? Yeah, your daughter asked me. Uh, you know, oh, how was how was school? Um, and I have many thoughts on that, but uh, but for me it was. Uh, so I'm going to back up just slightly, and I remember distinctly a conversation you and I had uh, in your studio before I even decided to to do the school thing and quit the computer science university stuff. Yeah, uh, and I sat down with you, and I said, "Rob, like, what the hell should I be doing here? You know, photography is really uh, exciting for me, and this other stuff is just kind of fizzing out." So, I I distinctly remember you saying, "Well, you know, like, what I would suggest is just go out and do the business stuff. You know, we can teach you tons. You can do lots of uh, stuff. You can learn. You know, you're you're a self learner, so just just go to it, hundred percent." And uh, and I remember saying, well, I don't think my parents are going to like that too much at the time because I was pretty young, right? Yeah, they and, want you to go to get that degree, right, that diploma. Yeah, so something like the next day I went and saw my parents and said, well, listen, like, uh, here's what I want to do. <laughs> and uh, they said, you know what, like, that's awesome. We're super supportive of whatever you want to do, but at least go get some degree, and that would keep, uh -huh. keep us happy. So... Uh, so it was kind of a, a truce between them and I just to say, yeah. okay, go and get this thing. And they and haven't you talked to you it. since. <laughs> uh, no, they've been pretty awesome about it yeah. all. But uh, so people. I did. Yeah, they're great. So um, so I did go to college, and I ended up going to Al Algonquin College in Ottawa, and it was, in many ways, an awesome experience for the people that I met there, and uh, you know, moving to a big town and meeting tons of photographers. There, it kind of shook up my idea of um, what an inter industry size could be. Um, but what I was telling your daughter was that the the actual schooling experience for me, um, because I came at it from a bit of a different angle. You know, I had been basically starting my own photography business uh, with your mentorship and James's mentorship. And, uh, so I had a lot of these skills already and a lot of these pretty advanced ideas about how I fit into the world of photography before I even stepped foot in this, you know, two-year photographer's training program. Mm -hmm. So uh, so I basically spent the two years uh, either not learning very much or doing a bunch of crazy experiments with all the gear I had access to uh, and also just um, helping to mentor other people who were there who needed some help, maybe with uh, some of the more technical uh, aspects of it all. Yeah, you tons of, of you know, tutoring people constantly. That was the role I took because it was interesting to me, right? I could help some yeah. people, which is a really core value of mine, and, yeah, and it yeah, kept yeah. me interested. Uh, otherwise, yeah. I was pretty uh, bored. So that's, that's pretty valuable in and of itself, if I could talk on that idea sure. just for one sec. Uh, I was talking to Maria, I don't know if you know Maria from Pittsburgh, 
she, we often text back and forth, and she told me she's going to uh, Georgia to judge at a PPA print competition, how much she enjoys it and that. I haven't told her this yet, but I, I'm going to get her to get on one of these podcasts and shoot the shit about judging and that. Because this applies to anybody with any ideas, with anything you have going on. When you talk about stuff and when you talk about ideas and when you just share ideas, when you just sort of even have casual, free flow, stream of consciousness discussions like we're having now because we have not planned any of this. And uh, when you have that kind of a discussion and it's called, you know, we're having uh, a dialogue it helps to resolve a lot of ideas. It helps to bring a lot of ideas together and possibly clear out a lot of not so valuable ideas. So when you're teaching the other students, I'm going to guess that it was um, still pretty important to you. Now, uh, not that it led you much or anywhere down the road, but the overall school experience, you seem to say or think that it was almost redundant and or, you know, unnecessary. Would you do it again? Would you take something else? Would you take a different program? Or would you, or was it overall all pretty valuable for you? <coughs> Excuse me. You know, it's a good question, and I've reflected on it uh, throughout the years, you know, while I was there, while I'm, you know, the, the years after that. And because uh, in some ways, I think, well, geez, I, I wasted two years where I could have been 100% focusing on the business of photography, right? Right. And two years is a lot when you think of it that way. Um, but there are some connections with people that I made throughout that time that are still people that I collaborate with these days. Uh, I just wrote up a, a proposal this week, a really big proposal with a really good friend of mine, Lucia, who... Uh, nice. Yeah, we're trying to collaborate constantly on different things. And so the, I think the network of people I met there, it was a core group of people who had a lot of the same ambitions and a lot of the same uh, ideas about creativity and uh, where to go with life, you know? These were... Nice. Uh, if you've ever met any photographers, you know that they're not your standard person, right? It's generally some eccentric people and uh, people doing stuff a little different. And uh, I've always been open to that group of people, and I'm probably one of them, definitely. Um, but it was those unique characters that was really interesting to be surrounded by them for two years. So, nice. in that way, that was really valuable. Um, I think it was the. I think when I refer to it being a little bit more of a, a waste of time, it's more the content, be, uh, and simply because I am a huge self learner, so I learned a lot of it on my own, and I learned tons yeah. of it mentoring with you and James for you know the so year. You're your skill set was pretty strong going in. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Were you like top of the class? Were you like Brent's the go-to guy? Anybody has a problem, go see Brent. He knows it all. He's like, wow. He's like a pro. Uh, in some ways, yeah. Um, especially in the first year because all of the basics of photography, some people, you know, they had just bought their first camera the day before they showed up to the course, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, so especially in first year, it was like, oh, can you just help us understand, you know, grasp these concepts really quickly. Mm -hmm. There were certainly other students in the course yeah. that were sort of that style of expert, but in different ways. Some people were really yeah. the creative experts. Some people um, knew how to push the envelope and fashion stuff, for instance. But uh, yeah. definitely with the technical side of things, because that seems to be where I lean to. Uh, yeah, right. certainly looked cool. at me. <clears throat> I um. Uh... I talk at high schools locally on career day, and I tell everybody, don't go to don't go to photography school. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to learn photography, there's no jobs. You got to learn be how to be a business person, learn marketing. So, tell them to take a business course, because mm -hmm. you know if their photography career doesn't work out, at least they can have that in their book. So, but um, yeah, you seem to have done good. So, I uh, just want to talk real quick here. There, there's Tuco's. There's their website. I sh we were talking the other day about Tuco's. Tuco's is in Sudbury, which is a mining blue-collar community. It's a vegan Mexican restaurant. The guy and his wife who started it, he's good friends with one of my good friends. So when I heard that this place was getting built, I was like, not in a million years is that going to go. It's in a real sketchy area. 
in what used to be an old KFC. Not that that matters. And Mexican food, generally those restaurants don't do well. And this is Sudbury, mining community. So I, all these things I thought it's never going to work. Turns out I was dead wrong. And lesson learned because, man, this place is rocking it, and it's one of the top ten vegan restaurants. It's a vegan restaurant in Canada. So we're in a meat and potatoes community here. That's where we met. I just want to show you. There's Jillian's website. Hey, Jillian, Jillian Bickle, who called me the week after I met her and said, I quit my course and I'm going into photography full time. There's your website. It looks familiar. You know that website. I like your logo. Did you design this? So a good friend of mine, uh, Claire Brennan, he's in Ottawa. Um, mm -hmm. He has a uh, creative agency, and uh, uh, he was kind enough to design that for me. And uh, it's cool. good to have good to have friends. Y you look at it, and it says Brent, but even though there's a missing part of two letters. So uh, yeah, I I you know I I I like the simplicity of it. And sometimes it just makes people take a minute or two to, well, maybe not a minute or two, but a few extra seconds just to, yeah. to think. So, um, yes, yeah, he did some great stuff for me. It's very clean. Um, so what else did I want to talk about? Well, unless you want to tell us anything about your experiences as a photographer so far and sort of what you think about the industry and or what your thoughts are. Because you're sort of in a different area than I am. I mean, I'm, the, I'm the wedding guy, babies, families, blah, 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 all that stuff, this kind of stuff here. I'm photographing these guys tomorrow, by the way. Cool. Yeah, we were just having a discussion. Hey, can I talk about that real quick? Of course. Do you know Glenn Tebow? Yeah. Yeah, member of parliament now, and he's just like big time politician. I photograph him every year. Uh, I just want to just want to talk about this real quick. I need my Facebook. So um, that's his wife. So I sent her a text talking about the uh, location and clothing because I, I you know I kind of know her and I'm like okay I want to get a dialogue going about their clothing and whatnot so that they put some work into it. Even though I've shot them every year, year after year, and I know them really, you know, photographically I've been, had them in front of my camera so many times, I still like to make these connections and communicate to people. So I send her a text, and she wants to have something different, something new. She wants to have the motorcycle in the picture again, blah, blah, blah. So this morning I did this here. I found this rock cut. I don't know if you know the one-up area. So that's uh, Glenn, that's her, that's the two kids, and that's his motorcycle. Apparently the motorcycle's got to still be in the picture. It, so, it looks a little different than them in the previous photo. <laughs> they seem a little yeah, shaped. Well, it's just the layout, right? So, But I'm yeah. pitching her, let's do something with that says mining community wall rock of doom in the background. Well, a lot of the rock around here, as you see in that photo, like the textures are just amazing. And the way yeah. the light hits it sometimes is just stunning. Yeah, so she's like, "All right, I like that," but she's, we got to make it Christmassy. I'm like, "Ah, oh, jeez." Oh, that's <laughs> why you have a Christmas tree in there. That's why I put the Christmas tree in there. <laughs> he really wants the Christmas theme. I'm like, "All right," he's feeling the spirit. So, uh, I have a sign that I use for weddings. Actually, let me show it to you. I'm going to show you this sign. I'm going to bring this sign, and I'm going to hang two garlands. The kids are going to hold this this sign here, and I add the letters later, so I'm going to put Merry Christmas or something on it. And I'm going to have the two girls hold that with garland, Christmas garland, and that's what I'm going to do, like the two girls, and then uh, the Christmas tree. And then we can add snowflakes and stuff later, you know. So, Anyways, the only reason I brought that up was because when I went here, they just happened to show up just then and there, so I was like, okay, let's talk about that real quick. You know, like to, I like to just get as much communication and clarity with people as is possible. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. What are some of your favorite shoots that you've done, and or what are you up to with the shoot that you're putting this big proposal together for? Is that uh, a is that an actual contract? They're sort of pitching, looking for proposals, or are you going at it cold? Uh, so, 
there's two. There's two, but there's one I want to focus on. Um, so there's one project that I did yeah. for this week, and um, it's it's basically a dream project. Um, oh, really? It's so if I guess I'll give a bit of background. So the the city of Sudbury, which is where you and I live, um, they're putting together what's called a um, oh geez, that's embarrassing. Um, you can't it's remember. Called, it's called the food strategy, and so uh, what a food strategy does is kind of tell the city, okay, here's where you're not. Here's some suggestions on how to increase, you know, some some uh, benefits to to community members around food. So some food insecurity, some like more access to local food, some more supporting farmers and stuff like that. Right. So far, none of that has to do anything with photography. But the reason it's uh, a dream project for me is that, as you can see on my website, one of the first photographs there is uh, those carrots there, which is, right. Um, if you click in there, yeah, there's a whole bunch of other stuff there. Um, it's you can make it bigger too by uh, just clicking in the middle there if you want. Um, so, food and local food and some really healthy food has been something that I've uh, really integrated into my life lately, um, maybe for the past four or five years. And so it's really become a personal interest for me. And nice. uh, that, that um, project you're looking at there is something I just started myself. Uh, so it's kind of a, a personal project that I did when I was living in Prince Edward County, just around uh, highlighting and celebrating the people that go behind, you know, the wine that we drink and the food that we eat. It's something that you can see a lot of those people are having a lot of fun doing some pretty simple work, right? Like cleaning yeah. up vegetables and harvesting some things. So um, I I lived on a winery for a year uh, nice. uh, out there and just learned how to uh, do a lot of this stuff and, and had the experience of being really close to uh, plants and harvesting and you know being in the sunshine for a lot many days and I just got this brand new uh, appreciation for a lot of the people that do this work uh, nice that ultimately gives us health right yeah. uh, so how that ties into this proposal this project is that the city is putting together um, basically a document with all these suggestions about around the food industry here locally um, which I've been connected to since I moved back here and nice. they you know they need a bunch of awesome photography to highlight um, every chapter and a whole bunch of stuff in that document so it really is a project that's perfect for me it's it hits on a bunch of personal interests it hits on uh, really some strong values for me and uh, some of this imagery is just right up my alley right so um, cool. it was yeah it's a dream job so I got a phone call saying hey could you please 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 quote on this nice well, so they came at you this is good yeah yeah these are phone calls you want to get right this is yeah. how you want it to be is people calling you for the stuff that you do so yeah uh, yeah super jazz this week about that so I've been working on that and uh, so put together this pretty cool proposal um, yeah. which is suggesting why why I'm that perfect person for them to get right well I hope um, you get it man that'd be awesome and, and you know this kind of a gig is the kind of thing that you can also you can make your own projects and pitch them absolutely, especially, absolutely. Especially the governments right yeah yeah so this uh, I actually got an update maybe an hour before you and I got online here and yeah. uh, and you're gonna love this because it's gonna launch us into a whole bunch of discussions but uh, they decided to not go with me they went with someone else and oh. uh, the reason they went with someone else was purely based on price so oh, okay. they basically said you know what it's the city and the person my contact there said uh, man we re like I really really want to hire you for this you're the perfect fit like right. it would be awesome. Look, but I just want to get clear on this. So they put a bidding thing out, and so which I hate. I hate those city yeah, bids. Yeah, yeah. Can't stand those because they always bid on price only. Yeah, so I know. And, yeah, and so their that's all it was. Yeah, their internal policy is that 
you know, if a project of some sort is over a certain price, they have to go out for bids, at least three contractors, and uh, they they award it based on, as far as I understand, you know, I, I, I don't know the policies that well, but as far as I understand, and I was told by my contact, she said, yeah, they kind of have to go on price alone. So no matter how perfectly suited you are for this project, uh, and they're not allowed to engage in any discussions to uh, understand the bids or change the bids. Okay. Uh, so I was very uh, specific in saying, okay, here's the price I put together, you know, based on what was actually very little information, and yeah. much of it I put together um, last minute for them because um, they're in a huge rush to to do this for various reasons, and uh, and so I, uh, you know, my big thing is transparent communication. So I said, you know what? If, if you have any questions about any of this, or you need adjustments in it, or yeah. you want to break it down differently, like let's have a discussion, right? Let's make it work. Yeah. And their policy is they're not allowed to even. Yeah. Those questions. It's a bureaucratic quagmire. It's awful. Oh, man, so <laughs> what a letdown! And it was I, for her too, the client. She said, like, oh man, it, it sucks, but we had to. Well, go at least that. you know where her heart is. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And and if it changes, she's gonna call you. Well, that's it, and that's what she said. And uh, but it just makes me think, like, ah, oh, like there are some projects out there that are perfectly crafted for us, but still, there's some strange things about this industry that just keeps us away from them. Well, when you're dealing with the government, yeah. whether it's uh, city, state, provincial, or federal, it's complicated. So interesting. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I and I. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to be the cheapest photographer, right? I want people to hire me for what I do, not for how cheap I am. So for me, it was, yeah, mixed emotions for sure. Interesting. Um, what else did I want to ask you? Did you have anything else on that, or other jobs that you enjoy doing, or that you prefer doing, or that you're that you're working on, hopefully breathing life into right now? Yeah. Um, I, you know, oh, I think you and I getting back together is interesting. There's a whole bunch of, like, non-monetary stuff that's ideas and things that are being thrown around. Yeah. Uh, and you don't always need to be making money to be having no. fun. No, well, for the record, it's all about money. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe I can launch into that topic. Like, I think in many ways I'm not your typical photographer. Um, yeah. I, I probably compared to a lot of people, I'm not that interested in making money. It's not the number no one way. thing that drives me. Um, certainly, I have to pay bills and, and do things like that, so I need to get paid. But, um, to a degree, yeah. Yeah, but the things that really jazz me about it is creating some cool art and meeting amazing people. And, and as photographers, we get launched into all these crazy situations that you would yeah. otherwise never be a part of, right? Like, I've been in the Bank of Canada's vault at some point. I've worked Taking with pics. some, yeah, uh, worked with some uh, another photographer on some, you know, Department of Defense special ops team stuff with nice. crazy weaponry and things, the top secret stuff I shouldn't be talking uh -huh. about. But, uh, so yeah, it's brought me into all sorts of amazing, cool situations, and uh, that's well, what I love about photography. Way better than that. Well, job. You know, I, um, yeah, I, you know, I don't know if it's when you have a wife and kid to feed. <laughs> and but I've always been sort of business minded, even when I was a very, very young man. Marketing was big for me, and I always knew that uh, yeah. uh, I had to uh, earn a living. So, um, <clears throat> turned me into a capitalist big time, but not like so big that it's wow. like the number one thing. I just value it and I value it in a sense that it's a wonderful tool. Money is frozen energy, it gives you way more options and you can buy cool equipment with it and it gives you a sense of freedom. Now the busier I got the more creative I got oddly enough so I, I noticed that sort of paradox you know because you've got your uh, your typical thumbnail shot of an artist who's lacking starving gypsy bohemian guy, girl and uh, they're the true creative ones, but that's not true. I discovered that uh, 
Yeah, the more money I had, and again, money is just a tool. It's one of the things in the toolkit. So uh, I encourage you to uh, sort of instill a little bit of that philosophy into your mindset, and you'll see the two will conglomerate. Um, I met guys who are doing their own projects, and I see you doing a lot of your own projects, <coughs> possibly a uh, book or two. A, a book right. or two. Well, yeah. I don't know. Tabletop book, highlighting photography, uh, you know, on a particular theme. Yeah, the direction I've been focusing on with this local food stuff uh, has been actually uh, a lot of gallery uh, showings. So I did right. one locally here and did one in Prince Edward County when I did that work. Um, and yeah, that stuff is totally transferable in so many different areas, right? This uh, coffee table books have been certainly uh, an idea, um, and the, I think that part of the truth is that um, it's just beautiful stuff. Like yeah. food is amazingly beautiful if you take them, you know, a moment to actually appreciate it, and uh, and that's true of so many things. But um, yeah, well, certainly a lot of you potential. used to volunteer at the uh, place that sold local. Local foods. What was it called? Local. Yes. yes. Uh, local. This place is called Eat Local. Yeah, local local food co-op. They had a book there of uh, recipes, vegan recipes, and I checked it out and I noticed it was the wife of the couple that started Tuco's Tacos. I forget her That's name. Nice. Yeah, Jess. But I was looking at that book. Have you seen that book? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's on my bookshelf over here. Nice, and I was like, okay, she went to some big city to get all this photography done because it was Definitely. really, really nice photography. Yeah. So perhaps <clears throat> there's something there too for you, food mm -hmm. and photography. Well, I think that, you know, that's a cool thing, you know, someone like you and I who have an open mind, like there's so much opportunity out there and there's so many possibilities. It's just about throwing yourself into them. you got to throw yourself at it. So, um this whole, whole idea of coming up with a project and pitching it cold makes a lot of sense. That's never, well, I guess it's sort of been a, a thing with me in my photography business, but I've been pitching markets that are very traditional. Right. Babies, weddings, families, fairy day, blah, 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 all that stuff, and all these packages that I've pitched and all these programs over the years. For but you... I think in some ways, yeah, continue, but i got something to say about that. It's, well, for you, it's a little more. It's a little more diverse and a little more open, a little more less traditional. Certainly. Yeah, and I think some of what brought me there was just some of the different experiences I had working with other photographers uh, in bigger cities, and yeah. also realizing that I could just make it all. You know, I could. Photography is flexible <laughs> enough that you can guide it into whatever you want. Um, you know, some markets are going to make you a little bit more money or some markets are going to be a little bit easier, or some markets are going to have a little bit more competition. But yep. uh, but it was really being able to craft it into, you know, throw my own interests at it and uh, have people hire me for what I love doing too. Uh, that was a really neat realization when I came to that. Uh, yeah, you like that idea. Well, yeah, because what, you know, sort of like this project that unfortunately didn't happen, it's like, it's it's a project I would do anyways. But if someone's <laughs> willing to pay me for it. I'm right? in. <laughs> uh, how perfect is that as a as a as a product, right? So, Danielle and I two years ago we were on Manitoulin Island. Okay. I believe it's, it was May. Uh, we we go we do an annual father daughter. We've been doing that since she was six years old, and um, we were booting around. Are you familiar with? What's the main town there? Just past Kagawan. Uh, and we were booting along the shoreline. I knew there was a lighthouse at the end of it, and there was a dead end. And we get there, and there was a dude about my age and an older dude, substantially older, with their car with the battery that was dead. And they were, they were like, waving me over. And um, they needed a boost, so I had cables. They boosted their car. We're standing around. I'm like, what are you guys doing here? And they were from Toronto. He was the old guy was from Toronto, and the other guy was from somewhere else. And he was shooting a book, tabletop book, for to do with the, uh, you know, the Cup and Saucer Trail? Yeah. That goes all the way down to southern Ontario. What is That's the Niagara Escarpment. 
So he was shooting the tabletop book on the Niagara Escarpment, linked in with this. The older guy was part of this association, the nonprofit. And I thought, well, wow, who knew? <coughs> who knew you could? Uh... So it's like there's all kinds of possibilities for you. you know what yeah, I mean? and that's what I've discovered through. Uh, actually, a real gift has been connecting with a bunch of different photographers doing a bunch of different things, and uh, that introduced a whole bunch of new angles and new ways of doing stuff. But um, that's exactly what you're talking about. Is exactly, I think, should be encouraged. Is that you can craft any project you want, and if you find the right audience, then maybe you have something sellable. And if there it is. You know, it's possible that you don't, but at least you had fun doing it. There it is. Yeah, like uh, so. There's there's a bunch of different approaches to to having a career in photography, right? Some people just pitch ideas to magazines. Um, it was so random. That's him right there. That's awesome. There's the dude right there, Mark. So <laughs> here we met these guys who were stuck. They needed a boost in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> Manitoulin Island. You want to know the fun part of all this? He attended a one-day workshop that I put on in Burlington like, two years prior on <laughs> wedding photography. <laughs> and he, so I'm, shoot, and I'm shoot, shooting the shit with them, and he goes, yeah, I was at one of your workshops. I'm like, you were? That's hilarious. That's so weird. But check it out, man. Check it out. He's got all kinds of books. He's got a yeah. whole ton of them. <clears throat> so I think you had to be doing books there, Brent, amongst various other things. You know, that's it's it's so neat to have so many possibilities that you have to just make a choice, right? Like there's there's so many things that are available to us to put our energy towards. And, uh, yeah, and, and naked girls. Well, you know. I'm joking. That's the big joke, especially with the older <laughs> photographers, is that's what got us into photography. Pretty girls, actually. I didn't mean to say naked girls. But uh, boudoir photography. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, so yeah, there's all kinds of possibilities. So when I met that guy who attended one of my workshops, I'm like, well, who knew you could do all kinds of stuff like this? That's great. And uh, who knows where you're going to end up going, and uh, hopefully we'll do some do some shit together too. I'd like to talk about some ideas that are going to come down the pipes. So. Sure. Yeah, and I think I love, what I love about that story, Rob, is that, um, you know, you've been doing this for a little while, and, and even... Someone else is teaching you a little something different, you know. Thirty-eight years, <laughs> thirty-nine. <laughs> but what's cool is if you're working at it and you don't give up, never, never quit, because you're always following your heart and connected to the job in one way, shape, or form. I mean, how many? There's like the really, there's photographers who've been at it well into their eighties. Like Ken Whitmire, he just died in a car accident. He was, what, 83? Mm. From Yakima, Washington. I don't know if you knew him. Yep. He used to put on a yearly workshop called the um, Wall Portrait Conference. He was all about selling big prints for portraits. And then there's, uh, I don't know if you ever saw Al Gilbert from Toronto. He won the Order of Canada because of his photography. He won it back in the 80s. But he's like 92 now. I don't know if he's still going, but he was going well into his 80s. So, I mean, man, in the grand scheme of things, Brent, you're just getting warmed up. <laughs> well, I remember actually a discussion you and I had uh, uh, when we first got connected, and uh, and it was the topic was about how photography, for some reason, seems to make people younger. Uh, <laughs> we had that discussion. We certainly did, and for some reason, it just fused into my memory, and uh, and I've got to say, it's true, like. For someone to be productive, you know, and super uh, excited about what they're doing professionally into their 80s, mm -hmm. uh, what a gift, right? And uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I just think that's really awesome. <laughs> but you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be willing to put up with the bullshit and the starvation periods, and you gotta be willing. I think, I think you gotta be comfortable making money, and you gotta learn how to. Bill them when they show up and uh, do marketing and be a savvy business person. So it's kind of a blend between the two. So that's very, very important. So it, Yeah, I mean, you can't have a successful 
photography business or business at all without money. Some kind of money or marketing or you know all that stuff you need. So you could be the best photographer and nobody knows about you. So well, no yeah. one's gonna hire you, right? So, that, right? Exactly. So there's, <coughs> uh, you know, your philosophy of almost putting marketing at the top of the list and photography is a little lower down, you know, is um, uh, I think essential. Like you got to be learning about the marketing stuff and updating yourself and learning new tricks all the time because uh, without it, you got nothing. When I'm done with this uh, podcast and when I put it where I put all my podcasts in the blog, I'm going to send it to Mark and uh, tell him that story. I'm, I, I couldn't remember his last name, so I'm, I'm actually, you got to love Google. I just typed in Mark Niagara Escarpment Buck, and I spelt his name wrong. It's a C, K, not a C. Right. Onwards. I mean, look at this guy. This guy, look at He's 83 years old. Look how good he looks. <laughs> Some people in their 30s look like that. <laughs> Um uh, joking. <laughs> okay, I'll let you go now, and uh, we'll do it again, and uh, we'll get a uh, professional mic going and uh, yeah, all the other good many stuff. Many apologies for that. That's fine, man. What's your cat's name? So there's two of them. There's uh, Emmett, who's kind of, you know, a little bit chunkier, but that's okay. And then there's uh, Cosmo, who's a black cat. I don't know. He's been roaming around. Sometimes you can't see him. I, we saw his button. We saw his tail go across the screen. Right. That's that his hello. <laughs> That's his hello. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I think we covered a lot of stuff for now. This was on your bucket list, you said, to do a podcast. Yeah, you know, I ingest so many podcasts and have a huge right uh, respect for a lot of them. You know, Tim Ferriss's podcast and even... Uh, a whole bunch of others, 99% Invisible for some more entertainment stuff. Joe um, Rogan. Yeah, and uh, so just, uh, I guess in a way it's being able to give back, but also just having the experience of being on that side of things. Uh, yeah. It's really a treat for me, and it's been on my sort of bucket list for five plus years. So, uh, yeah, huge thanks, Rob. It might open up doors. It's gonna uh, It's going to start stuff, which I love. Here's the thing. Uh, I'm a big believer in uh, just just go. Just fire up the button, hit the record, get the microphone turned on, and go. Uh, as far as doing any project or any decision of any kind, including podcasts. I've pitched many people, random people who have never ever been on a podcast, before and it kind of scares people, you know. So, you obviously jumped on it, and uh, who knows where it's going to go. And because uh, it could evolve into something, let me just—I just got to read you that quote. Okay, sure. I, I, I think it applies. I wrote a quote this morning. I was driving here, and it just just is roaming in my brain here. Dreams and goals don't manifest and unfold the way you originally picture them or think they will. Doors open up, new paths reveal themselves, and opportunities show up. Make your dreams as big as mountains. So it doesn't matter how crazy your dreams are. Just make them big and just go. Just So um, when it comes to doing something like a podcast, it would scare a lot of people. You know, I can't do that. I don't have this, don't have that. And uh, I just like... Uh, Momentum and communicating. Momentum and communication, very, very big for me. <clears throat> um, I gotta. I just gotta tell you this before we close up here. Hold on. Stupid ads. Oh, I gotta set you up. I'll fix that. Yeah, I know. I could kill those ads, eh? All right. I listened to this yesterday. Joe Rogan, number eight seventy-seven, with Jordan Peterson. I listened to it for my third time yesterday, and it was like it was the first time I listened to it. Mm -hmm. First time I listened to it, it blew me away. Now, I know I sent you the link. I don't know if you've watched it yet. Not yet. But it's compelling as oh hell. Uh, a guy a not much older than you sent it to me. My cousin's kid from Toronto sent it to me about four months ago, and it blew me away. 
<coughs> Joe Rogan had Jordan Peterson, who's from Toronto. He's a University of Toronto pro, uh, professor. Had him come down to California and do this podcast. Now, Joe Rogan, like Tim Ferriss, when they started doing podcasts, they had no idea it was going to blossom. It was like this quirky little thing they were doing, and it just, boom, turned into this huge thing. And uh, so this uh, particular podcast interview with Joe Rogan, with Jordan Peterson, just blew up Jordan Peterson's notoriety and fame. And since then, he's had him down two more times, once about three months ago, and I think three weeks ago. <coughs> three weeks ago, they had a third guest, who was the uh, university, uh, uni college, uni Evergreen College biology professor. There's a bit of a thing going on there. I won't get into it. But the first time and second time, it was just Jordan and Joe. And both times, Joe at the very end said, this was the best podcast I've ever had. Joe has a lot of podcasts. We're talking tens and twenty millions of uh, downloads and views. This is one of the most popular ones. Look at that, 2.3 million views. It's epic. So I encourage you to watch it. I encourage everyone else to watch it. There's some very, very, very relevant social issues at hand there. Plus, a lot of real um, self-help type stuff, but it's pretty advanced shit as far as I'm concerned. And it's mind-blowing. Like, Joe Rogan, you can just see he's totally captivated. And for him to be quiet and not cursing every two minutes is like epic because Joe Rogan is just like he's he's a talker he tends to bandstand a little bit and he curses like <coughs> worse than a sailor uh, he was totally captivated as he will be too I That's encourage great. you to watch it oh, I wanted yeah. to pitch that you know because I just thought it's a wonderful thing hey share the wealth well, yeah there's so many uh, you know same as the Tim Ferriss podcast and a lot of others you and I listen yeah. to there's there's some real gems in there, and uh, sometimes, you know, not necessarily every episode is going to be for everybody. Uh, no. But sometimes there's, there's some that I'm not interested in. Yeah, but somebody else Talks might certainly be. Or... MMA and that, I'm not interested in that shit. Right. And, uh, <laughs> you know, if you find something like this that's a real gem for you, and, uh, you know, someone like me, who you know enjoys a lot of the same topics and stuff. I think cool. you're going to like this yeah. one. Yeah, it's great. Especially towards the end, the last 40 minutes was mind-blowing. Good. Yeah. You know, and I see that the podcast there is like almost three hours long. Um, yeah. And sometimes that's what it takes to get down to the stuff that's really, really uh, revealing or really uh, mind-blowing, right? So I, you get, uh, get away from the everyday like chit-chat and then all of a sudden you dive into these really great topics. I got to tell you though, three hours goes by like a flicker. Yes. For me, anyways, watching this, like I said, I watched this one three times already. Right. Like a flicker, boom. Like I, I listened to it while I'm work flowing. Did a right. wedding last Saturday. I'm almost done the wedding. I'm 95% done, and I listened to it. This was, this was my wedding workflow podcast. Right. So You know, enjoy. I'm on my way. To, uh, it's, it's perfect timing, Rob, because I'm on my way to Ottawa in the next few days uh, just to do a bunch of stuff out there for business and pleasure. But, uh, you know. There's a five-hour drive, so this is perfect. <laughs> you can download it. I rip them, the YouTube videos. I know he's got them as a download somewhere else, but I just go rip the YouTube video and I put it on my phone. Bingo! Okay, I'm going to stop recording here and uh, don't hang up yet, okay? okay? Any last words? No? No? Yeah? Uh, just a big thanks, Rob. This has been super fun. We'll do it again. Great. We'll do some more. <laughs>